Hi, Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel. I'm very pleased today to be with Phyllis Farrell, who's Vice President for Global Alzheimer's Disease for Eli Lilly and Company. Importantly, Phyllis is making a big difference in this disorder through the work that she does with her colleagues at Eli Lilly and Company. Phyllis, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your background and tell us what you do. Thanks. Well, Bill, it's really nice to see you again. Um, so I am the head of the late stage drug development team at Lilly. And so we work on Alzheimer's drugs that are in that very last stage of development, getting ready to actually get them out the door to a patient. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I work cl closely with some of the best scientists in the world. You know many of them. I do. And, uh, and we're really excited about the partnerships that our scientists have with the uh, academic and broader scientific community as well. You know, when we think about Alzheimer's disease, we think about this uh, really tragic condition and we think about how it impacts the individual and the family. And we think about how many people are impacted. So it really takes a team to make a difference. Tell us about the team that you're involved in creating and motivating. And, and where are we going to go? We, we talked about this goal of curing Alzheimer's disease. Where are we going with that? Give us the lay of the land, if you will. Right. So um, there are millions of people affected with Alzheimer's disease. They think it's about 5 million in the US alone. And you're right. I mean, this is a devastating illness for patients, uh, for their families. I mean, it's a disorder that affects the entire family, as many know. And it's actually going to bring our healthcare systems around the world to their knees if we don't do something about this disease quickly as the baby boomer generation ages. So our country, the United States, has set a goal um, through the National Alzheimer's Plan to have a treatment or a cure for the disease by 2025. Now that's a very aggressive goal and uh, there's a lot of alignment and collaboration and work that has to be done um, both within the pharmaceutical industry but also together with our healthcare system partners, policy makers, um, physicians of course and their families, advocacy groups. So the team that I lead and the way that we structure things at Lilly is actually cross-functionally just like that. So we have scientists and statisticians that run the studies, but we also have people on our team that is taking all the information that we learn and working together with advocacy partners, working with physicians to understand their needs, working with organizations like Medicare to understand what do they need to see, and then of course our regulatory agencies like here in the U.S., uh, the FDA. So this effort is all being pulled together. Give us your sense about your, where we stand. I mean, is 2025 reasonable? Are we going to get there and achieve that goal? And if so, how are we going to do that? So our goal at Lilly, we aligned with the national goal, is to make Alzheimer's dementia preventable by 2025. Mm. And the reason we chose those words, we chose them really specifically, is that because um, Alzheimer's disease, we know now that the plaques associated with the disease, the amyloid plaques, probably start building 15 to 20 years before the actual symptoms show up. But it's the dementia that's associated with the disease that is so debilitating for the patients, for their families, for our healthcare systems. So we started with that word. We also chose the word preventable because we knew that it wasn't something that any one company could do on its own. Mm -hmm. And so we may really achieve some special things with science. We're still not quite there, unfortunately. We've had a recent disappointment. Um, but we, we have a lot of work to do on the science side. But even if we were completely successful scientifically, um, we still have a lot of work to do in our healthcare systems. Mm. So today in the United States, only about 50% of the people with Alzheimer's disease ever receive a diagnosis. And those that do receive a diagnosis tend to receive it very late in their disease. And because this next generation of drugs is actually looking at slowing the progression of the disease, if you're diagnosed too late, you won't actually be able to benefit. So I have a lot of hope for 2025. Uh, there's Alzheimer's disease in my family, and um, so I hope it's fast. Um, and I think we've got the greatest scientific minds work in the world working on it. Um, but I also have hope that 
our leaders in the United States, our healthcare providers, our politicians, our policymakers, will also kind of wrap their arms around this disease and make sure that our healthcare system is ready to take care of folks as well. You know, as I think about the healthcare system, um, <clears throat> I think about how difficult it has been for the community of those people who work on Alzheimer's right. to understand just what you've said, that this disease, <clears throat> and it is a disease, begins silently, it is, uh, it silently uh, compromises brain function. There's an increasing evidence of it at, at multiple levels, but in, in fact, people will have had the condition that produces Alzheimer's for a decade or a decade and a half before they ever really have symptoms. So not only do we have to think of the science differently, for example, looking toward prevention and certainly looking toward early treatment, we're gonna have to convince the healthcare system that we should be doing that, right. and that the investment in research and care needs to begin at a time when people look pretty darn normal. Right. What's your thought about that? Well, we see the problem in enrolling patients in clinical trials. In fact, I'd tell you we had a lot higher success rate of getting to that 2025 goal if we had more people talking to their physicians today about the symptoms that they were worried about. Right. And um, so one of the real big innovations that we've had in the field recently is the ability to actually see the plaques in the brain in a living person. So it used to be in order to do that, you actually had to do a brain biopsy. And of course, many people don't volunteer for brain biopsies. Right. Right. But now we have these wonderful technologies that allow through a PET scanner to see amyloid plaque in the brain. And um, so with the advent of that, we've learned now how early these symptoms start. So um, I think the other thing that's done is something we hear from patients is they know that they're not crazy now. Mm -hmm. They know they're not weak. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with Alzheimer's disease, as we see with other mental illness, there's a lot of stigma that because it's not something that can be measured like blood glucose or HbA1c or, or even cholesterol, they feel like a brain illness means they're weak. But now they can actually see a picture that shows that there's something real, a real disease, to your point, that's going on in their brain. So I think that's a huge innovation. And I think it will encourage a lot of people who otherwise might wait to talk to their doctors to feel a lot more confident about talking to their doctors. And then I think it might make doctors more confident to make a diagnosis because now they're not doing it purely on symptoms. They actually have um, a picture to help guide their decision making. You know, as we, as we move through the next decade or two decades, the notion of personalized medicine of better quality medicine is, is gonna come forward and we're gonna have the ability to do much more than we can right now. But what about those people who actually, those internal medicine people, those family practice people, don't we need to get to those people and tell them, look, there's a, there's a bright future ahead for Alzheimer's disease, but we need you right. to identify those problems and be engaged in a very early stage Absolutely. in helping to follow those patients and getting those patients to clinical trials. Don't we need to do that? Oh, absolutely. The, uh, the frontline physicians, nurse practitioners, people that love these patients and their families, they'll often tell you they knew something was wrong. If you yeah. think about it, I live in a very small town, and a lot of our physicians in our town, they'll treat someone from when they're a baby all the way into adulthood. Mm -hmm. So those physicians often know something's going on. Um, they worry about the patient, but they also, when they see those things happening, they tend to treat the whole family. So they worry about the family as well. And so those frontline physicians are critical, and they need to know that there's a role for them to play, that there's something to be done, I mean, we know now that the rates of dementia have actually declined, and the belief is because our health care around cardiovascular disease and things like that have gotten better. So there are things that you can do today, even without a disease-modifying agent, that will help the family. And those primary care physicians, those family physicians, internists, the nurse practitioners that get to know these families very well, they should feel confident to be able to take action that there are things that they can do today. So maybe that's a message that we can leave with the folks that are watching the video, that there is something to be done today. There is a role for the patient as his or her own advocate, the family as an advocate for the patient, and their physician to become much more aware of Alzheimer's disease, much more aware of what needs to be done to diagnose it correctly, and to treat what can be treated with a very great hope that soon the work that you're doing with your colleagues 
is going to result in a treatment for Alzheimer's disease and ideally a cure. Phyllis, thanks for being with us. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel.